Hi, welcome to the Quipster Film Review Podcast. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I invite you to check out over 4,000 of my written reviews. You can read anytime. Quipster.net is where to go. Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to click the link to my other podcast that comes out a little bit more frequently and at least more consistency than this particular podcast. It's called Around the World in the 80s Movies, where I do a weekly look at films from, of course, the 1980s. And I invite you to check that out by clicking the link you'll find on my website. Quipster.net is where to go. Today I'm going to be getting into a brand new entry. Speaking of films from the 1980s, this particular franchise started in the 1980s, but it didn't get its third film until here in 2020. It is called Bill and Ted Face the Music. It's a PG-13 rated film. It does have some language in it. I probably could have gone down to a PG. It's very consistent with the other films in this franchise, which were PG rated. It's a an hour and 31 minute film. Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter return as Bill and Ted. Kristen Shaw, Bridget Lundy Payne, Samara Weaving, Aaron Hayes, Jamie Mays, William Sadler, Anthony Kerrigan, Jillian Bell, and Kid Cudi are in this film. The director is Dean Pariso, and the screenplay credited to Chris Matheson and Ed Solomon. Now, this is the third entry in the Bill and Ted franchise. It's been in development on and off for decades, really. It started and stopped many times, and that's partially because the film studios thought that a reboot, after some time, that had new teenage slackers from San Dimas High School, that would probably be a better continuation of this franchise, given the amount of time that had passed and grew since the last film in 1991. There were opportunities that were abounding after the debut film from 1989, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but momentum for the franchise dissipated. There was a 1990 animated series that lost its flavor with the departure of stars Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter to do the voice work after season one. In 1991, there was a very poorly received video game featuring Bill and Ted, and then in 1992, there was a live-action spin-off that had different actors that fans wouldn't embrace. They actually did the voice work for that animated series for season two, and by that point, the fans were pretty much bailing on the property. In 1991, there was a follow-up to Excellent Adventure. That was Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. That did fail to connect with a larger audience than the first film. They were hoping it would actually make more money because the first film was such a huge hit on home video and on cable showings, but the jets cooled on the property for the next 10 years when the second one failed to gain as much traction as the first. Now, sometime in the early 2000s, the writers of the films, Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson, they created the characters back way back in 1983 during work in their improv comedy group. They came up with these characters on their own. They attempted to revive their franchise with the titular characters as middle-aged men by that point. Still, Keanu Reeves' manager advised against it. Even though Keanu Reeves was very interested, his manager felt it was going to be a backward career move, and that effectively killed the franchise at that point. In 2007, there was some talk. Frank Mancuso Jr.'s production house, 360 Productions, they they attempted to make a straight-to-DVD release that wasn't going to have the involvement of Solomon or Matheson or the main actors. It was going to be written by Gabe Griffoni and Susan Francis, but after the announcement, nothing really came of it, so it pretty much dissipated there. About a year after that, Keanu Reeves started to warm up, especially publicly, on making a third movie, when he started to get a lot of young people engage him in conversations about how much they love the Bill and Ted movies, and Even more so, he was talking about Bill and Ted than some of his more lucrative properties by that point. So Solomon and Matheson, knowing that Keanu was starting to be interested, they revived their story of Bill and Ted as middle-aged men. They would make their pitch with Keanu on board. This time, though, it was the studios that were a bit wary. They noted that the first two films had little cachet, especially in international markets. It was barely released outside of the United States, and the audience, they felt, was aged out of the property. Solomon and Matheson, though, they argued that the reputation of Bill and Ted had only grown over the many years since their initial theatrical run. They felt that the audience that wasn't even alive for parts one and two was going to be there to watch a third film, but they'd have to find a way to prove that their property could be relevant to a younger and hipper audience that was going out to the theaters. 
So Matheson and Solomon, they started to work on the script and they spent years on it on spec. They wanted to make sure everything came off right. They didn't want to make a film just to cash in on nostalgia for the series. They loved these characters. They created them and they didn't want them to return unless it was going to be on par with the other two films that they had made. This would be made with affection by people who truly love the characters and for audiences who feel that same devotion to them. They also wanted it to be a fun experience for younger audiences who may not have experienced a Bill and Ted film before. Now, to tantalize the studios further, Solomon and Matheson pitched the concept that they would introduce a new Bill and Ted in the form of having children. They would be able to continue the series if this was lucrative. They initially scripted Bill and Ted to have sons, but they changed the characters to be their daughters after a couple of revisions because they felt that it offered more exciting directions to explore than just a mere carbon copy of the Bill and Ted characters with different actors. The daughters' names would be Thea, a.k.a. Theodora Preston, and Billy, a.k.a. Wilhelmina Logan, kind of in keeping with the names of Bill and Ted, although each dad here names their daughter in honor of their respective best friends, so don't get confused by the naming of the characters with their friend's name instead of their own dad's. Orion Pictures liked this angle. They bought it, and so they agreed to fund a $25 million budget for what they felt was enough to finally push forward with a Bill and Ted 3, which they gave the title of Bill and Ted Face the Music. The story here in the finished script involves Bill and Ted. They're now married. They have one child each. They're suffering a midlife crisis. They realize that they never had united, even though it was foretold in the first couple of films, they never united mankind through their music with their band, The Wild Stallions. In fact, contrary to the end montage of Bogus Journey depicting their ultimate success, Face the Music shows the duo they have become jaded after a career where they're now nothing more than a laughingstock rather than the most popular band on earth. The pressure to fulfill their destiny finds that their marriage is on the rocks, they're seeking couples therapy, but one where both couples seem to be involved simultaneously. That's really the inability of this duo to separate their codependency is one of the issues of their marriage. Someone, though, comes from the future and tells them that they need to write that song that unites humankind within the next 77 minutes or global peace and harmony will never be achieved. In fact, the universe is going to come apart in this cataclysmic event called the unraveling. So their plan is they're going to use the phone booth time machine to travel forward in time to steal the song from their future selves, the one that actually did, they feel, eventually create that song. Now, of the original films, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure from 1989, that's probably the most beloved because it is much more optimistic and upbeat for the audience. Bogus Journey, it didn't fare as successfully. It's a bit darker. It spoofs more obscure subjects like Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. It does have a cult following among fans. Cinephiles like it a little bit more because there are a lot of cinematic references in it too. Now, Face to Music recaptures the fun-filled spirit of the original 1989 film, but it does honor the second film by incorporating some of the characterizations and some of the story developments, including the Grim Reaper, who is once again played by William Sadler. Galaxy Quest Dean Pariseau, he comes in as director, not only due to his experience with making fun comedies, but he's also a trained musician. He's a cellist, and he knows about the uniting power that music provides. And that would be especially be key because the music for the film it wasn't even mentioned within the script as to what the songs were going to be. They had no set songs before filming. So in addition to the typical soundtrack of popular acts that they would fill the movie with, there also needed to be one really great song from the Wild Stallions to deliver by the end of this film, by the end of the story. They didn't have a final song set, so they needed to act those scenes out still. Bill and Ted and the rest instead rocked out to Obla Di, Obla Da by the Beatles. They were going to play that song at least to do their scenes, and they would insert their finale song in post-production. It had a similar tempo, 113 beats per minute, and it would have the same joyful vibe so that the movements of the actors would fit, not only with the tempo of the song, but also with the overall feeling. In addition to that, Bill and Ted fans were asked to submit clips of themselves playing music to exhibit, and that would be during the film's credit roll ending, and so you'll stick around through the credits to see some of those clips. The underlying score also proved to be a challenge for Mark Isham to compose, and that's because the COVID outbreak in 2020 paused post-production for two weeks, so they had to get their heads together, but not physically together, to determine how they were going to continue 
to do post-production on the film without worrying about the spread of the virus. They started working remotely, they edited the film, they scored the film, and typically, you know, if you compose a film score, you have an in-house orchestra, but nothing in the United States was going to accommodate so many musicians indoors for days during the pandemic. So the producers and the composer Aisham decided to record remotely this orchestra that would be located in Budapest, Hungary. Strings would perform their pieces one day, then brass the next, and then woodwinds would record their pieces individually from the respective musicians' homes, and they would put it all together to try to make a complete score. Quite a challenge here, pretty much unprecedented in the history of films before this year. The film itself does take some time to get its pacing. There are new characters here to introduce. You have 30 years of character history really to get audiences up to speed. There's this couples therapy subplot that's a significant contributor to those early lags, I feel, but it does effectively provide an extra dimension to these characters and their need to mature by the end of this film. The older Bill and Ted, they time travel to talk to themselves at various stages of their lives. It's kind of good fun. Their future selves aren't always cooperative, and that generates some good comedy. They are eternal optimists by their nature, which makes their attitudes toward even the most dire of situations pretty fun for us in the audience. The two leads in particular, they remained good friends in real life, and they seemingly have effortless chemistry that makes them enjoyable and likable to follow just about doing anything. I could watch Bill and Ted almost ceaselessly because they're just so fun and funny to watch. Bridget Lundy Payne, she credibly mimics Ted's vocal delivery and mannerisms as his daughter, Billy. At the same time, Samara Weaving is maybe less descriptive than her father, Bill, as Thea. But then again, you know, Bill has always been maybe not necessarily as much of a, a mannered performance as Keanu Reeves gives Ted, but Keanu granted Samara Weaving the role when he discovered that Samara is the daughter of his Matrix co-star, Hugo Weaving. Now, time is going to tell if the series will continue with the daughters. If they do, whether they're going to provide the same chemistry for audiences of Reeves and Winter, it's not necessarily evident here. But certainly the actresses that they put in the roles do generate some appeal, at least in this film. Now, for the nemeses, other than the future Bill and Ted themselves, William Sadler here is returning in his most famous role as the Grim Reaper as Death. And he gets a producer credit for his efforts, which generally will mean that he probably received a back-end cut. The musical star roundup throughout history, it includes characters, uh, Jimi Hendrix and Louis Armstrong and Mozart and a few others, even Kid Cudi appearing as himself. He gets an invite to join in on the festivities. There's this Terminator-like assassin from the future, played by Anthony Kerrigan. He's out to snuff the heroes in the scheme to stop the unraveling somehow. This robot is improbably named Dennis Caleb McCoy. I suppose some people find the fact that a robot has such a common name would be funny. He, like the Grim Reaper, initially seems menacing before becoming another lovably goofy character to replace death, we presume, in future entries if they get made. After the passing of George Carlin, who appeared in the first two films in 2008, Bill and Ted instead deal with the daughter of his character Rufus. Her name is Kelly, which actually, in an homage here, happens to be the name of George Carlin's real-life daughter, Kelly Carlin. And to further pay homage, Kelly Carlin appears in the film in a cameo role. It is essential, I feel, to have a firm recall of the prior Bill and Ted films. I would not recommend taking in this film without seeing the first two. And if you haven't seen them in a while, I do recommend you checking them out again before taking on the third film because there are references to a lot of the phrases, a lot of the gags that I don't think that you're going to fully appreciate without an intimate knowledge or at least a fresh knowledge of those films. Missy Preston Logan, who served as alternately Bill and Ted's former stepmother, she's getting married here yet again. The plot borrows from both of the previous films in many ways, having to gather great musicians throughout history. That's reminiscent of excellent adventures, historical figures being gathered up, and then they take things to the afterlife in the second half of this film, which is very much like Bogus Journey. Although this is relatively inexpensive for a modern film, I do think that they do a lot with a little bit of money to make it 
still an eye-popping experience. Dean Pariseau, he had enjoyed working with concept artist Bill George when they worked on Galaxy Quest. He secured his services yet again to design the different realms and the worlds, including Hell and the Future and Death's House in this film. Green screen effects, they're obvious, but they abound from the visual effects artist Nancy St. John. She did work for notable films like Babe and the Gladiator, so no slouch there. I still think it looks pretty good considering the green screening. The makeup is especially good. The old age makeup for Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter does look pretty good. They have rubber muscle suits in one particular scene to simulate hard bodied inmates. I think those look pretty outstanding. I almost thought that they put their heads on other people's bodies, but no, they were actually well fitted suits. It was not an easy scene, by the way, to make the temperatures where they filmed in New Orleans. It climbed toward 100 degrees, and that's with very high humidity there. Alex Winter, in fact, nearly passed out from the heat on a couple of occasions during those scenes. But in this era, I do think it's nice to see something like Bill and Ted Face the Music that exudes a message of love and of unity and some choice laughs along the way. In this era of COVID and rioting in the streets and protests and all of the madness that you see whenever you watch the news. The warmth and the good vibes are a welcome respite during these times of isolation and the bleakness of world events. And despite that PG-13 rating, I still think this is wholesome fun for the longtime fans and as likably daffy as its two main characters. And that's why I'm going to recommend Bill and Ted Face the Music with the same grade I gave to the first two films. I think it's on par with them. For fans of three stars out of four, three stars on my scale means that I do recommend it for people who like this kind of movie. If you're a huge fan of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure and bogus journey, I do think that you're going to get some mileage out of this third entry. Certainly, it tickles the nostalgic funny bone for sure. If you're not familiar with the first two films, I definitely think that you should at least watch the first one. If you like that enough, you'll probably want to continue with the second and third. If you don't like the first one, I don't think that there's much hope that you're going to be turning around on the series after that. But at the very least, I do recommend watching 1989's Bill and Ted Excellent Adventure as your litmus test. And if you do listen to that, I do have an episode on that on my 80s show around the world in 80s movies. Find the link to that at my website, quipster.net. Now, obviously, because of the coronavirus concerns, Face the Music, it is not really in theaters. There are some select theaters that are showing this, but it's primarily available on video on demand. So you're going to pay kind of a premium, at least at the time of this recording in early September, to watch this. They have packaged the first two films along with it if you want to pay like five bucks more to own. So it's actually a pretty good deal if you don't own these movies altogether and you want them. So you can check that out wherever you usually catch your video on demand services. There's also an extra scene after the credits, so don't bail on the movie right after the credits start rolling. So I definitely recommend sticking around for that last scene. So three stars out of four is what I give Bill and Ted Face the Music. Now, if you do actually watch this film and you want to talk to me about it, I definitely always like to talk about some of the films that I review on this show with people who are listening. So if you have your own thoughts on this, you can reach out to me. You can find my contact information at my website. That's at quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Links to my Twitter feed, Facebook page, and Instagram are also ways to get in touch with me. You can find all of my contact information there at that site. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. And please enjoy your time. Anytime you get to sit on a couch and just pay money for a movie that was supposed to be in theaters, but you can enjoy the theatrical experience at home. Yeah.